Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We'll go with you. They went out and caught, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net, into the right, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. And so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire built there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. The second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you to take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After this, Jesus said to him, Follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. This uh, Easter season uh, that we are in the midst of, we have the opportunity to see a series of post-resurrection appearances of Jesus to his disciples. We get to see when the risen Jesus shows up to his disciples after being raised from the dead. And so, Last week, we had the story of Jesus showing up on the, the night of Easter, uh, the night of the resurrection, in a locked room with most of his disciples there, except for Thomas. And so we saw him show up again a week later in that same locked room, but this time with Thomas there. And now we see a third appearance of the resurrected Christ uh, to the disciples here on the shore of the lake. And so last week, in those first two appearances, we saw that when there is something getting in the way of Jesus' relationship with a disciple, Jesus goes to them directly in order to bring about reconciliation, bring about, uh, to, to break down whatever it is that's standing in the way of that relationship. And so we saw it uh, with the disciples in his first appearance to them after the resurrection. They would have feared uh, how they, he might come to them at that moment after they had abandoned him uh, during his trial. They had all scattered and, and fled, uh, and so they didn't know what to expect. But Jesus doesn't leave them to wonder, are we good? Are, are we forgiven? Jesus comes to them directly, and the first words he speaks to them are words of reconciliation. Peace be with you. Then he does the same with Thomas, coming to him directly uh, to give him the experience that he had missed of the risen Christ. We see in our first reading this morning that later he'll do the same thing 
with Paul. Paul who, or Saul, who had an outright animosity for Jesus and his followers, is it, Jesus comes to him in the most direct way possible at that point in, of appearing to him uh, with this vision and this voice. Well, now Jesus comes directly to Peter as well. And when there's something that could potentially be in the way of Peter's relationship with Jesus, Jesus addresses it directly. And perhaps as Peter would look back on this triple questioning of Jesus, do you love me? He won't be offended, but he'll recognize that that triple questioning matches Peter's triple denial of Jesus back when Jesus was arrested. When there's something standing in the way between Jesus and his relationship with one of his disciples, Jesus goes to them and addresses it directly with grace, with forgiveness, to move toward reconciliation. But here with Peter, it especially comes out, and it's there in each case if you read them carefully, there's something more going on here than just forgiveness and reconciliation. That healing of whatever stood between Jesus and the disciple in the relationship leads to something else. It leads to a commissioning. To do, to enter into a new role and a new task to which Jesus is calling his disciples. And so for the disciples as a group, we saw last week, Jesus breathes on them the Holy Spirit to empower them to forgive sins, to declare the forgiveness of sins. With Thomas, it was a call to faith, of an, to an ongoing trust and confidence in God's grace and power. With Paul, we read it, it'll be a, a call to suffer in order to bring the good news of Christ to the Gentiles. Here with Peter, Peter has a special call as well. It's a call to take on the role of of the shepherd, feed my lambs, care for my sheep. Before he ascends, Jesus commissions one of his disciples to take the role now of the shepherd. Now, if you look back at that passion story of Peter's denial of Jesus three times, it's actually perhaps more of a denial not of Jesus, but of Peter himself. Peter denies who he is. He's asked three times, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter says, I am not. So the actual language is denying his own identity, his own role. That is not who I am. So in this moment of reconciliation, Jesus reaffirms who Peter is. Jesus reaffirms Peter's vocation, his role as a disciple of Jesus. Jesus says, yeah, I, I know what, you've, what you did, but you're forgiven now, and we're moving forward. Here's who I need you to be. You are my disciple. And the disciple I need you to be is the shepherd now. Now, Peter, of course, still doesn't quite get it. If we were to read on in the following verses after our gospel reading ended, we would see that he's concerned about comparing himself with another disciple. He looks at John, the disciple who's narrating this story, who he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Peter looks at him and says, what about him? I mean, isn't he your favorite your right-hand man? If I'm the shepherd, what does that make him? And Jesus tells Peter, that's not your concern. This is what I'm asking you to do and be. Many of us can probably identify a bit with Peter here. We have a tendency to doubt ourselves, to deny the identity or calling that God gives us, the vocation to which Jesus calls us, especially when we've messed up, like Peter did. When we've done something 
that makes us think, well, I couldn't possibly be worthy of, of God's love, that becomes yet another excuse for us. Well, I'm, I'm just a screw-up. I, God couldn't possibly want me for that role. I don't have the, the skills for that. I don't have the disposition for that. I'm not organized enough for that, whatever the excuses might be. We deny God's call for us. We deny our God-given vocation because we are afraid to disappoint. We're afraid of the responsibility. And then as another form of excuse, we compare ourselves with others, right? Well, I can't possibly do what that person does. I'm not that good. Jesus tells us you don't have to be. You just need to be faithful to who I am calling you to be, to who you are. And so Jesus shows up for us when we're having those moments of self-denial, denial of our God-given identity in baptism, denial of our God-given vocation, the calling that God gives us, the unique calling for each of us as his disciples based on our gifts. When we are in that moment, in that place of self-denial, Jesus shows up. Like he shows up for Peter on that shore. And he tells you, just like he tells Peter, I know who you are. And I love you. And you are exactly the disciple that I need. You are the disciple that my mission to this world needs. And therefore, you are the disciple the world needs here and now. And when Jesus shows up on that shore, he hosts a meal one more time in which he gives Peter, equips Peter with everything he needs to fulfill that role that Jesus is calling him. In that meal that Jesus hosts on the beach, we're reminded and the actual language of the text reminds us of that meal, how Jesus took the bread and gave it to them and he, and he took the fish and gave it to them. We're reminded of the Last Supper that we remember when we share Holy Communion around this table. A meal in which we experience Jesus' presence, equipping us with everything we need to fulfill the vocation to which he calls us. And Jesus does give us everything we need. A community around us to lift us up and support us in our giftedness and the role that Jesus calls us to. He gives us unconditional grace and acceptance, a new covenant that is not dependent on our ability to keep it or not dependent on our perfection in fulfilling that role that Jesus calls us to. And so we are free to live into that role without fear of failure, without fear of repercussions if somehow we mess up. And finally, in that meal, Jesus gives us himself so that as we live into that discipleship, that role to which he calls us, it's not our own strength and our own power and our own ingenuity that helps us to fulfill that role, but the power of Christ working through us. These resurrection appearances of Jesus at the end of the Gospels are not the end of the story, but the beginning. Not a conclusion, but an invitation. They're an answer to the question that now, now that we've experienced the risen Christ, now that we've heard the Easter story, what now? What do we do now? When Jesus does show up in this story, what does he find the disciples doing? They've gone back to their old life, to what they did before, fishing. It's easy post-Easter, to go back to the way things were before, back to the old world. 
the disciples themselves, those who had actually witnessed the empty tomb and the risen Christ, they revert back to their old life. Peter appears to be tired of waiting for something to happen, maybe waiting for the Holy Spirit to come that Jesus had promised, and he says, ah, I'm going fishing. All the other disciples says, okay, we'll go with you. But worst of all then, going back to their old life doesn't work. The nets are empty. Returning to their old life yields nothing but emptiness. What do they do now? They can't move forward. They can't go back. They're stuck. That's when Jesus shows up and says, remember who you are. You are my witnesses in the world. You are a people who are called with each of your unique talents and abilities into unique roles in my church, my mission of sharing the good news of a God who doesn't keep score, a God who doesn't hold our faults against us, To share the good news, Jesus says that I have conquered death and evil for all. And as you do, to care for one another. Because this life to which you were called, this life of swimming upstream, of going against the current of our culture, is not easy. And so care for one another in community as you do. So all of our gifts just like Peter, play a special role within God's mission. When the risen Jesus shows up, he brings God's reconciling grace directly to us and says, you are forgiven, you are loved, and then extends that invitation to join in God's work in the world. May Jesus' reconciling grace and freedom give you courage to embrace his calling for you as his disciple. Amen.